My job this morning, the first thing, is to introduce our keynote speaker. And Chris Gibson is here today. Um, he is the CEO and founder of Recursion Pharmaceuticals. Um, he is someone that we have known for an extraordinary long period of time when he and I were both very young and had more hair. Um, the, first, the first time that we met, Chris, was back in 2011, and that was the one year that we had our science meeting outside of the US. We had it in, in um, Chantilly, France. And he came and he talked to us about this interesting and novel idea that CCM2 regulates superoxide and nitric oxide in the endothelium. He was at that point a student at the University of Utah um, working under a, a very famous scientist named Dean Lee, who is now um, a, an executive at Merck. Um, pharmaceuticals. Um, he went on <clears throat> two years later. I, I think had you graduated yet by that point or not? Yeah. Okay. He graduated. That, he did that. He graduated, and on November fifth, twenty thirteen, he he and us uh, two other people founded Recursion, um, and Recursion was one of the very first, if not the first, pharmaceutical company to use artificial intelligence in. Um, figuring out which drugs might be effective for conditions. And amazingly, just a few days after the founding day, he was with us again in Washington at our science meeting, and at that point explaining the premise behind recursion. High content screening reveals CCM pathophysiology and potential treatments. Um, and then uh, he, you see him there as a younger man with Kevin Whitehead, who has been at every science meeting up until this one. Um, and is one of our, continues to be one of our science advisors. So um, this is how long we've known each other and how the type of relationship that we've had since then has been very close, very supportive of in, in both directions. And our timeline includes not just um, watching him grow up as a, as a PhD and a physician, but also watching the progression of the science. And so in 2015, there was a paper published in a journal named Circulation that identified vitamin D and Tempol, which would go on to become REC994 as potential treatments for um, the condition for CCM. Um, in 2017, they were, Recursion was participants in a meeting that we uh, asked for with FDA um, called a CPIM meeting, Critical Path uh, Innovative Innovation Meeting, in which we were discussing what appropriate endpoints would be. What does better look like and how would we measure that? Um, we all walked away from that meeting with FDA quite discouraged because they weren't hearing us. Um, and it didn't look like anybody's trial would ever be able to launch. So we went on then to continue talking. Um, in the meantime, uh, an IND, an, an investigational new drug uh, uh, approval was granted by FDA to REC994. REC994 prior to that had gained orphan drug status, which makes things a little bit easier to get it to market. Um, and the phase one uh, was launched already without actually necessarily knowing what was going to happen with phase two and what was going to happen with FDA. So in 2019, we went as a just patient organization back to FDA. I'm not sure if there's anybody in the room right now that was part of that group, but there were five patients and me telling our stories about what the clinical endpoints could look like that were not just hemorrhage, because there is a much wider variety of things that people experience, as we know. We also, at that time, um, recursion made it possible that the CCM health index could be developed, and that is the very first survey measure that patients fill out. It's patient-reported outcomes measure where patients can report their symptoms and where we can measure based on patient report whether something is getting, whether anything is getting better um, as a result of a treatment. So time went on, more FDA meetings that we were all involved in, those called by recursion, a lot, a lot of work together. And I had the pleasure, that's not me, that's Chris, but I had the pleasure of speaking at the bottom of those big stairs at Recursion Headquarters um, last March, March 2022. And Chris was visibly affected by the, the presentation that I gave. And I was able to talk with him a little bit afterwards. And at that point, he said, look, Connie, the problem right now is that 
it's, it isn't happening fast enough. And so we've all felt that, Chris feels that probably um, more deeply than even we do, um, because it just, it's 2011 is when we first got to know him. This was 11 years later, and um, the phase two was just beginning. And phase two is the first time that a medicine is tried in actual patients. Um, and so the Sycamore trial launched. Uh, it was to be 52 weeks of a patient taking the medicine, enrolling 60 subjects. Um, and lo and behold, there, I don't know if you can see the little print, but in uh, at the, basically the same day that I was talking to them, Recursion was announcing that the very first patient was enrolled. And that was the point where all of us recognized we had some, or at least I did, that we had more control about the pacing now because this is where the patients could be involved. This is where patients could make a difference in how fast this moves along. And you all stepped up in a huge way. Um, just a few weeks ago, it was announced that those 60 patients were found and enrolled, um, and now we just have to wait the 52 weeks for that last patient to finish their last dose before whatever this headline turns out to be, this release is going to be that the phase two trial has successfully at least completed and that the data will be analyzed to see whether it's, it makes any sense to, to have the drug move forward. This is, again, the very first time that we've had an industry-sponsored trial of a, of a drug, of any drug, but of a drug that's specifically being um, developed for CCM. And so being able to get through this, no matter how it turns out, is an important step for, I can't even explain to you how important this step is. So. All that said, for the patients in the room, I need to give you some bottom line rules because I know there are some of you here. Um, for regulatory reasons, people from recursion, and it's not just Chris here, there are at least three or four other people, are not allowed to know who's in the trial. They don't want, um, FDA doesn't want them bribing you to say good things about, you know, like there just needs to be some boundaries between you and them. Um, so please do not tell anyone in recursion that you are in the trial, should you happen to be in it. Um, if there's time for questions at the end of Chris's talk, please do not start your question with, hi Chris, I'm enrolled in the, in the REC 994 trial. Um, you can keep that to yourself and just ask your question. We will have a microphone that we will walk around um, for those of you who are not able to walk up to the, the standing mic here. Um, and if you run into anybody at break time or over lunch time, please, again, keep your trial participation to yourself, uh, but feel free to engage them and ask them anything. Um, after that, I will have a little bit of a talk, and then after that, at break time, you all, will, the patients will move to a separate space. But without further ado, I made it in my time limit here, I would like to bring up Dr. Christopher Gibson, someone who is near and dear to our hearts. Thank you. That was great. Good morning, everybody. It is a huge pleasure to be here, although after seeing the picture of me 10 years ago, I'm feeling pretty old. Um, always fun to start the day with that. So let's make sure I have my talk set up here. Don't worry, it's 94 slides, but I'm gonna go really fast. Um, so uh, Connie, I think, gave you the headlines, and what she asked me to do today was talk a little bit about drug discovery, drug development from our seat at Recursion, um, having seen this last decade working on CCM and other diseases and looking forward into the future, and to try and share this story in a way that would resonate for patients, resonate for scientists, resonate for clinicians. So it's a tall order, but I'm gonna do my best. Um, I have to start with this disclaimer slide because we're a public company now, so there's lots of rules. And thank you, Connie, for mentioning some of the rules around patients and recursion. We wanna do our very, very best to make sure none of us do anything that could hurt the outcome of the trial. And one of the things that I'm most excited about is that regardless of whether recursion's trial ends up reading out positive, together, all of the patients, the alliance, recursion, all of you are paving the way for some company at some point uh, to make a huge impact to try and bring a medicine for, for patients who are affected. And it's fantastic to see that there are multiple companies here today who are all working on this disease. That's a huge change from five to 10 years ago. 
So I'm going to tell three intersecting stories. For the mathematicians in the room, you'll see Recursion's name come up here. And I'm going to start a little bit with the story of CCM, which Connie shared a little bit about. I'm going to share a little bit about the story of Recursion. And then I'm going to share a little bit about the story of Tech Bio, which is this new field of using machine learning and AI to try and discover medicines. And I'll talk about that field more generally and what I hope is what the future of drug discovery looks like so that one day people aren't saying it's not happening fast enough because I think all of us feel that today. So let's start with the story of CCM and my circuitous, circuitous path to Chantilly back in 2011. Um, and it starts with a lesson which is to embrace serendipity. And so this is where I was back in 2009. This is in Texas, the University Hospital, uh, where I was working on my MD-PhD. Quick adjustment, I actually dropped out of med school to start the company, so I am not a physician. I've only done the book years. Um, but I was studying here, and my wife, also a physician, was about 1,000 miles away at the University of Utah doing her medical residency in neurology. And so every other weekend, I would hop on a plane and fly up. And one weekend, I flew up to see her. And this is before all the medical resident hour restrictions. Uh, and I got there on a Friday night, and I left Sunday night, and I actually didn't see her because she ended up having to stay in the hospital the whole time. Uh, and it was at that moment, as a married couple, we decided this was probably not the best path forward. And so I did something really bold, which is I flew up and I met this guy. This is Dean Lee. Please, no screams for those of you from the audience who weren't prepared. Um, this ended up becoming, some of you know Dean, ended up becoming my, my dissertation advisor. But at the time, he was just a big, scary head of the MD-PhD program at the University of Utah. And I had to convince him to take a transfer student from Texas who wanted to be closer to, to his wife. And ultimately, um, that talk ended up going well. We talked for a couple hours that first time. Dean's a pretty engaging, intense guy, um, still is to this day. And I didn't want to do anything that he was doing in his lab. I really disliked genetics. I disliked molecular and cellular biology. In Texas, I was working on using printers to print like bones and livers and things like that, which is super cool. And at the end of our conversation, Dean said, look, I need an engineer in my lab. Why don't you come here, and you can come here and join our program, but you have to join my lab and bring the engineering perspective to all of this stuff, which I didn't tell him I didn't really like. And I said, okay, let's do it. Uh, I love my wife very much. I will suffer through five years with this guy. And it ended up being uh, five of the best years of my life. Dean was an incredible mentor, still is, um, and a co-founder of Recursion. And Dean's lab was studying our blood vessels. If you ask Dean, he will tell you every disease in human biology has its root in our cardiovascular system. Um, and what he was in, in particular trying to understand was the leakiness of the lining around our blood vessels. Uh, and so one of the ways he was studying this was through CCM. Because as you all know, vessels become leaky in this condition. And Dean was hoping that by understanding the genetic underpinnings of that leakiness, he could learn something that would be helpful for patients with that disease, but also we could learn something more generally about how to control the stability of our endothelial cells and our uh, blood vessels, which could have effects across many different diseases, from cancer all the way across to cardiovascular disease. And about the time I joined the lab, this is a little bit later, this was some of what was considered to be the state of the art of the field. So this is 2011 from Nature Neuroscience Reviews. These are some of the pathways that many of the folks in this room had helped uncover. And uh, Dean's lab, along with a number of other labs, had really centered in on the activation of rho A. Uh, and he really wanted to understand how that particular protein was driving the disease. And about the time I joined the lab, we were working on animal models of the disease. This is from a paper we published uh, shortly after I joined, where we built endothelial specific, specific knockouts of CCM1, CCM2, and CCM3. So we knocked out those genes just in the blood vessels of mice. And here we're showing how the lesions those mice got look very much like the lesions that humans get in their brain, with the exception that they're much smaller, because, of course, mouse brains are very, very tiny. Uh, and so we were doing all kinds of work, and we finally, around 20, uh, 2009, 2010, had some of the tools that we needed 
to really go and test this hypothesis of whether Rho A activation was driving the disease. And so we used a widely available medicine. In fact, many people in this room may be on this uh, drug. It's called simvastatin. And through HMG-CoA reductase, it's well known to have a pretty strong negative uh, inhibition effect on Rho A. So it kind of blocks this pathway. And I remember being in the room when our, the lead student on this program, Audrey Chan, uh, read out the data. And after five months of treating this mice with simvastatin, it didn't work in our hands. Now, there's lots of reasons why this could be. It doesn't mean this pathway is not involved. There's others in this room still working on this pathway, and I'm glad that we're taking all the different avenues. But in that moment, in that laboratory, we were humbled by science. And for all the scientists in this room, I know this is a frequent occurrence. Um, you can see here that in the statin-enhanced diet, we trended towards actually making these animals worse. Not quite statistically significant, but, but close. And so this was a pretty rough day, honestly. This was a rough day. Um, this, this is what I felt like walking home that day from, from the lab. But there's another lesson here, which is to embrace failure, because in these failures is where I think often the biggest opportunities uh, can be found. And I think just three or four days after that lab meeting, there was a well-known investigator named Stephen McKnight from UT Southwestern who came to the University of Utah to give a seminar. And I was in the audience that day, and he talked about a phenotypic screen that I think probably took up an entire generation of postdocs uh, across the entire state of Texas, where they actually dosed mice with thousands of different drugs individually, and then cut up the brains at the end of their life and asked whether any of these mice had more sort of pre-neurons or neurons. And so you see in the bottom there on the right, the bottom right, that sort of squiggly thing with black dots, that's good, and the thing on the left is not good. And this paper had gotten a lot of acclaim, and I remember after this talk, kind of sitting around in Dean's office with this guy, Kirk Thomas, um, who's a, a well-known guy in the genetics field, and Dean, and we're like, how did they do that? Like, how did they find all of these from these, like, we could barely tell the difference between those, between those slides on the bottom. Like more black dots, less black dots, but like, yeah, it doesn't really look that profound. And yet they had this amazing paper and it looked like really exciting research. And we, as we sat there, we recalled something really, really important, which was when we look through the microscope at endothelial cells, human endothelial cells, where we've broken the expression of one of the CCM genes, they look really different. So different that, you know, when we have a brand new high school student come in for a summer rotation in the lab, we couldn't blind them to what they were looking at because all of us can see the huge differences between the cells on the left and the cells on the right. These are the same cells, just on the right, we've knocked down CCM2. And you can see how they kind of look angry. There's all those green fibers and the red border of the cell. Uh, these, these cells look sort of activated. And so we wondered whether or not we could do what Stephen McKnight did and do a phenotypic screen. And as opposed to taking this hypothesis about what was driving the disease, which we'd done with Roe, could we actually ask the biology to give us the answer? Could we treat these cells on the right with thousands of drugs, this time not in mice, just in human cells, and ask whether any of those drugs made the cells look healthy again? And so I got to work coding in MATLAB, and three days in, I stopped coding in MATLAB because I'm not a good coder, and I started Googling, and lucky for us, it turns out there was already a woman who's really good at coding named Ann Carpenter. She's at the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT, and she'd already written software for biologists like me to be able to do machine lear basic machine learning screens to look at images of human cells or worms or really anything that you can imagine to try and understand the differences in an unbiased way. And so we set to work doing this screen. And this is an image from the screen. You can see on the right, we took lots of pictures from wells where we had taken these human cells, we'd broken the expression of CCM2, and added about 2,000 different bioactive compounds. And we got some interesting results. And I remember this was a, a rough lab meeting. Um, we were reading out some of the results. Interestingly, simvastatin showed up, again, both by, by blinded reviewer picking this out and also the computer vision algorithm that we use picked out simvastatin again, so that's an interesting tidbit. And then we had stuff like, look at the bottom right, look at rosmarinic acid. That doesn't look good. 
I mean, you don't have to be deep into this space to understand that when the cells look like blobs like that, it's probably not a good thing. And so I had spent a good bit of Dean's money um, and we were going down this path and it looked a little bit worrisome. But we decided to push on because science is always full of twists and turns. And I'll keep in mind this particular um, image right here. This is Tempal, which later became REC 994, which was picked out by the machine learning system, but was not picked out by blinded human reviewers. And so ultimately, we took these 39 or so drugs that had worked according to a computer vision algorithm, and we took them into a variety of different assays, an endothelial cell function assay looking at um, barrier function, and then to an acute animal model, and we sort of whittled it down until we took two molecules, vitamin D and REC994, into this same five-month animal treatment that we had tried with simvastatin a couple years before. And I'm showing you here some data recursion has generated since that time, not the original data which is in the circulation paper, but we were able to show both in CCM1 knockout mice and CCM2 knockout mice that this particular molecule, REC994, was able to reduce the number and size of lesions. We also showed a variety of other measures that are interesting for those who want to dive into the science. And this was pretty exciting because this was not at all what we expected. There were a couple of researchers in the field who believed that oxidative stress could play a role. This is an antioxidant. And so for this to come up as one of the strong hits and to work in the animal model told us something about the disease that we at least hadn't been paying attention to as closely as maybe a few of you had. And it was surprising to us. And so we went and you know, tried to understand this better, and there's some publications out that many others in this room have probably contributed to. And ultimately, what we found was that in patients or in cells where we'd broken expression of one of these CCM genes, there's a superabundance of these oxidative uh, species, this superoxide, um, which is this reactive sort of, uh, think of like, like a fizzy drink. It's like this oxidative, uh, um, molecule that's jumping around in the cells and kind of causing havoc. And our cells actually have a system to deal with this. There's a molecule called superoxide dismutase II, which can help clear the extra superoxide from our cells. And it turned out that we found when you broke the expression of these CCM genes, this molecule was really low. And we were able to trace that back up to a transcription factor called FOX01, and we sort of lost the trail from there. But this told us something interesting about the disease that was unexpected, and I think that's the beauty of phenotypic screening. And so despite the pushback from the FDA, um, I'm kind of linking stories here. This ended up becoming the, the nucleus of recursion, uh, and I'll get to that in a minute. We pushed forward and started this phase one trial because we believed this data, and we figured eventually we'd convince the FDA to at least give us the shot in partnership with the, the uh, alliance. And so, we took the drug through IND enabling studies. Uh, we took it through a phase one study. And the good news is, at least in a small phase one study, the drug appeared really, really uh, safe and tolerable in that particular study. So you see at the bottom, these significant adverse events, SAEs, this is the thing that you don't want to see when you're running a phase one study in healthy volunteers. And you can see that all the doses up to 800 milligrams a day for 10 days, we saw that there were none of these SAEs. And really, there weren't any significant differences in, in the small side effects that people were reporting. Now, in the phase two we're running now, we may find that there are side effects, and that's part of what the phase two is designed to explore. But it's at least exciting to see that at a, at a baseline, there was nothing really problematic with taking this drug for 10 days. Uh, and soon we'll read out whether or not there's any issues with taking the drug for, for a year. And so ongoing now, as Connie mentioned, is our phase two trial. We've got uh, random, patients are randomized into a high dose, a low dose, or placebo. They take this drug for 12 months because in our discussions with the agency, it was really important for us to not only determine whether or not the drug did something helpful for patients, but also to really uh, uh, deeply understand whether or not the drug could be taken for long periods of time. Uh, so that's why it's such a long treatment window. And so as Connie mentioned, the last patient was enrolled uh, just a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago now, I guess. And so that patient will go through their 52 weeks of, of treatment with one of these randomized arms of the study. And after that time, our team will go through, will be unblinded only then, and we'll go through all of the statistics to read out and figure out whether or not this drug is safe, whether or not it's doing anything potentially helpful. Um, but as mentioned, this is very exploratory. 
we're the first company to go to the agency to try and understand whether or not this particular medicine works, but also really to set the pathway for other companies who might end up following along, to ask questions about what endpoints might be useful for companies, for academic groups, and for the agency to look at when evaluating medicines down the road. So a lot of responsibility that we're sharing together, and it's been an amazing uh, partnership with the Alliance to Cure, amazing partnership with Connie, the whole team, with patients, clinicians, many of whom are here in the room, and scientists as well. Um, and regardless of what happens with that study uh, in the next 12 to, to 18 months, it's really exciting to know that there's now gonna be a pathway for people to evaluate medicines. And hopefully, it won't be very long before there's one approved for patients with, with CCM. So I'm now gonna transition a little bit beyond CCM and talk about the story of recursion. Uh, you heard a little bit of it, but we found something we thought was pretty interesting. We'd use these images of human cells to ask questions about biology, and they led us to kind of an unexpected outcome. And this is very different from some of the other tools that people had traditionally used in phenotypic screens, things like genomics and proteomics and ELISAs, because images of human cells represent a holistic, sort of high-level uh, understanding of cellular state. Changes in genetics, changes in uh, transcription, changes in protein state, all of these things may turn out to change the way cells look. And so we started recursion based on this hypothesis that in biology, structure suits function. And any of you who are physicians know, as long as you still have good bedside manner, that if you walk into the room and you meet a patient, you can often already start to get a sense of many hundreds of diseases that could be affecting that patient just by little clues in the way they look. Maybe little dots along their nails or the shape of their fingernails can tell us something about disease. It's kind of amazing. And it turns out that that idea that you have at the top line of patients also scales down to the level of human cells. And so at Recursion, we used this uh, approach pioneered by Ann Carpenter, who I introduced you to earlier, called cell painting, to look at different components of cells and then train machine learning algorithms to extract from those essentially a mathematical representation of cellular state. And we decided that CCM was so exciting, we wanted to ask if we could do that 10 more times, 100 more times, and one day, 1,000 more times, and really, really try to understand biology broadly. And so the third lesson is stand on the shoulders of giants, but not for too long. And so as soon as we had this idea, um, I defended my dissertation October 31st. We started recursion November 5th, which required me to drop out of med school. But before that, I got Dean to send me to Stanford for the summer. And so Dean sent me for five or six weeks to this like mini MBA for scientists program. Um, this is another depressing picture of me from many years ago. Um, <laughs> depressing for me at least. Um, and I got to spend time in Silicon Valley. And it was amazing. So many things were happening. Moore's law was showing us that technology could exponentially improve. I got to meet people who were building autonomous vehicles all the way back in 2013. SpaceX was literally double landing rockets autonomously at the time. It was an amazing time to be in Silicon Valley. And yet, there was this depressing fact, if you zoomed out above CCM, that in the biopharma industry, we were actually getting worse. So despite all of this incredible technology, it was costing more time and more dollars to get fewer drugs approved year over year over year on average. And I think the reason for that is that biology is so massively complex. Massively complex. Probably most of it is too complex for us to even understand, for us to develop mental models to understand. And yet the tools we have at our disposal require us to debate at a whiteboard, to publish papers with these two-dimensional figures. And that's not bad, it's just that those tools may not be enough for us to really understand biology broadly. And on top of that, humans are full of bias. We are like the most biased creatures that there are. And I think those together drive this incredibly slow process, which we are living together now, of 10 to 15 years and $2 billion of investment in the biopharma industry for each new drug that gets approved. And I think all of us can agree that that's 
unreasonable and we have to do better. And the question is how? And the thing that motivates all of us is that patients are waiting. And so when Connie mentioned before that I was affected by this, you know, my wife as a physician treats ALS and she gets to tell me stories about her interactions every day and every week. It's very real to me, the, the time that, and how much it matters for these patients. And this is a wall of pictures of patients from around our headquarters in Salt Lake City. And we've gotten to meet almost all of these kids at one point or another. All of these kids were here when we put this up in 2017 when we moved into our new office. And now four of these kiddos aren't with us anymore. Um, which is really, really hard. Um, and it drives all of us to push hard, to push really hard, because it's unfair. Sorry. So the fourth lesson, moving away from, from the patients for a moment, is that humble beginnings breed excellence and discipline. And what Recursion did not start with was a $100 million check from a Silicon Valley firm. We got off the shoulders of those giants really quick. We started with $130,000 from the three founders. I contributed the least because I was a grad student, and most of it was on my credit card with a cash advance, possibly. Uh, and this was, this was day one. This was the morning of day one in our office, which was a conference room we rented from the university. And we threw a office warming party with all of our friends and invited them to bring us things like cup of noodles, paper, and staplers. Uh, and that discipline, I hope, has, has lived on in the company. We don't buy used lab equipment anymore. This was us in San Diego buying a bunch of lab equipment. We got it back to Salt Lake City, and then most of it didn't work. Uh, and so we realized that maybe that wasn't the best strategy. We've learned some lessons along the way. Um, but ultimately, we decided to build recursion to ask the question, could we try and replicate what we had started with CCM across many different genetic diseases. And so now I'll move beyond CCM and talk a little bit about this field of, of tech bio, which I think recursion has played a really important role in helping to, to create. As I shared with you before, our industry, biopharma, is getting less effective year over year. And there's this thing called Arum's Law, and if you haven't heard of it, it's Moore's Law backwards because it's just us getting like exponentially less awesome at bringing medicines to patients, despite hundreds of thousands of incredible scientists working really, really hard. And Moore's Law, as you all know, is basically one representation of the way technology keeps getting exponentially more powerful. I won't say better, but more powerful. And so there's this opportunity that exists between these, this arbitrage that may exist. And so I love this quote from Archimedes, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it and I shall move the world. And so I decided I would, for this talk, um, make this into a discussion about how AI is gonna change drug discovery. But I'm really bad at illustrating things. So this is as far as I got. And then I said, this is a talk about AI. Uh, you can tell I used PowerPoint. This is a talk about AI. Let's see if we can make this a little bit cooler, a little bit spicier. And so I went to Midjourney. Who here knows about Midjourney? Anyone? Okay, okay, some early adopters, I love it. Midjourney is a tool where you can type in text and it will just make an image. So I typed in this tech, Midjourney. Imagine a photorealistic image of Archimedes pushing on a lever, resting on a fulcrum and lifting the world where the lever is stylized to be artificial intelligence and the world is stylized to be biology and drug discovery. And it made this, which is not at all exactly what I asked for, <laughs> but. <laughs> We're in the early days. It's still kind of amazing that I could write that and get this. Not perfect, but imagine just being able to write this text for anything. You can go on Midjourney right now, sign up, and you could write, imagine anything, and get an image of it that's close-ish. So I thought, maybe I'm just not good at writing the prompts. Let me try a new prompt. So I, this one's creepy. I imagined a photorealistic <laughs> image of an artificial intelligence using a lever to lift up science. I don't know what's happening with the extra arm down by his waist. Um, and science looks like a metal pole, I'm not sure. But again, making progress. Here's another one. This time I asked for a female artificial intelligence um, and I asked the sphere specifically to represent biology and drug discovery. This one also kind of creepy. Um, you know, the AI apocalypse hopefully isn't coming. 
But it is incredible what these tools from just two years ago, this wasn't available, what these tools are allowing us to do in fields that are totally different from drug discovery. But I think what I'll tell you is that these worlds are converging. And so for all of you early in your journeys in science, pay attention to this because you're gonna need to know uh, the, the path of technology as well as the path of biology. And so to talk about tech bio, I'm gonna go back to pre-2015, chapter one, which I call frustrated founders off the beaten path. Um, and why was it in the early 2010s that there was a moment for a new breed of biopharma companies, ones that would bring together technology and biology? And it's because there was a convergence of new tools, and tools enable us to build new things. There were new tools in bio, so this thing called CRISPR was just kind of coming out. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's a big deal. It's super awesome. A lot better than siRNA, at least in our hands. And by a lot better, I mean like exponentially better. There were tools in automation, so robots that would allow companies like us for less cost than what they had in the past to be able to automate science. Even storing data was decreasing exponentially in its cost. Today, recursion has more than 23 petabytes of data to put that into perspective, if you took every movie in human history, in every language ever made in 1080p, it would be about four and a half petabytes. So we've got about five times that much data. And it's a lot less expensive to store today. It would have cost billions of dollars to store that data 15 or 20 years ago. And today, it costs millions of dollars to store that data. AI was starting to become a thing. It had been around for 20 or 30 years, um, really driven by folks up in Canada, actually, who had kept it alive in Toronto and Montreal. Um, and it was really starting to have this renaissance in the early 2010s. There was an increase in compute, thanks to Moore's Law. And so there was this weird group of companies that all started between like 2012 and mid-2014. Um, and if you look at this list, these are the companies today that are generally most recognized to be leading this field of, of tech bio. And they were all st started right in this kind of two-year period. And what I think is fascinating about them, and I have no real hypothesis on this, um, is that all of these companies were sort of wonky in different ways. None of them were in Silicon Valley. None of them were in Boston. They were in Vancouver, Washington, Dundee, England, Toronto, Salt Lake. Um, Hong Kong, these, all these companies were started, started, sort of started off the beaten path. And the Series A investors who led their funding rounds were also companies that nobody had, or, or investors that really nobody had heard of. These were sort of unproven second or third tier investors at the time. But at, all of these folks saw something and an opportunity to take advantage of that arbitrage that technology was giving us in, in the context of biology. So if we go to the late 2010s, I call this chapter of pipelines and partnerships. And this is an interesting Nature Reviews drug discovery paper that shows on the right, this is the number of drugs in phase one, two, and three across the entire biopharma industry. So you can see that in 2010, there were just under 2,000 drugs that were at some level of discovery and development in the biopharma industry. And this is sort of generally trending down over the last 10 or 15 years. And on the left, unfortunately, with a different y-axis label that makes it hard to directly compare these, you see the drugs in the pipeline of, bio, of tech bio companies. And there were none of those, really, until the 2010s. And by the late 20-teens, you start to see hundreds of drugs, dozens of those recursions, dozens from other companies, starting to move not only in discovery and preclinical space, but into clinical trials. And this represents this huge shift for the industry. And the industry finally starts to, well, they stopped laughing and started to actually take note of the potential that may exist as this new wave of potential treatments moves across the, the space. At Recursion, we've got about a dozen programs that we talk about regularly. Um, five of those are in clinical trials now, and a sixth one is going to launch pretty soon. These are mostly focused in rare genetic diseases like CCM, in oncology, and we even have one, uh, one program here in infectious disease. And we're not the only company. There's another public company called Accentia that has multiple programs in phase one, phase one, two trials now. There's a well-known company called Relay that has drugs in, in mid and late stage clinical trials using a variety of different AI and ML tools. There's a company called Abcelera that actually got drugs 
uh, onto the market during the COVID crisis with some of their partners using AI and ML for antibody discovery. And so this wave is finally starting to happen. We're starting to see early promise from leveraging technology to make drug discovery go faster, be cheaper, and ultimately bring better medicines to patients, I hope, in the next couple of decades at lower costs, which is what I think we're all here to, to try and do. And partnerships are starting to, to, to really come on the scene too. So about 18 months ago, we signed a partnership with Roche and Genentech. It's the largest discovery collaboration in the history of biopharma, not just tech bio, the entire industry, to go after the entire field of neuroscience. And when I say neuroscience, I don't just mean the rare diseases, we're going after all of the big ones too. And we're working with Aviv Regev, who's the head of Genentech's uh, R&D unit. And interesting note, she's the first computational biologist to be the head of a major R&D unit at a pharma company. And the very first big deal she did was with us to try and go after this space, which is super, super exciting. A decade-long partnership together. So huge investment from Roche and Genentech, huge investment from us, and we're not the only ones with these uh, uh, partnerships. Our friends over at Accentia, which is based in the UK, they've done huge deals with Sanofi and a number of other companies to similarly go after areas of biology that so far haven't had great treatments. So it's a really, really exciting time, but it's also now the time where the rubber meets the road. Uh, and this space is starting to get really, really crowded. So this is an image. Back in 2012, 2013, there were about 10 of these companies. This is the space today. These are the companies who were using AI and ML drug discovery. Probably about 90% of these companies say they're using AI and ML and they're not really using it. It's become sort of a hypey trend, which is problematic for all of us. And so we'll see what happens over the next couple of years, but it's actually been in the business side of things a really interesting time because the VC funding environment has shot down alongside the decline in the, the broader markets for biotech. And so there's now 400 or 500 companies using AI and ML and much less cash to go around to fund them. And so lots of interesting things are happening in that space. But at the end of the day, the outcome of all of this, I think, will be better medicines for more patients. It's a question of how soon it happens. So as we look forward, um, I wanna talk a little bit about how AI is gonna change everything. And this is important right now because these trial readouts are looming. Benevolent has had one readout already, it was negative. Uh, Abseller has had a positive readout. And here in just about a year or two, Recursion's gonna have three different readouts from our programs, including the CCM program that we're all here to talk about today, uh, or the disease that we're here to talk about today. And so this is a really important time because people are gonna over-index. If the first ones are positive, people are gonna think, oh, AI and ML is gonna solve everything. And if they're negative, they're gonna say it was all just hype. But if you fast forward over the next five to 10 years, I think what you'll find is that this is part of an ongoing trend. And the best way I've heard it described to me, because who's, who here has heard of ChatGPT? Okay, that one, more people than, than the other one I asked about. Mid-Journey needs to do better marketing. ChatGPT uh, has really changed the space. People are starting to take notice of the power of ML and AI, and it's certainly not perfect, but it's becoming really, really interesting. And our board chair, who I'll show you, introduce you to in a minute with a video, um, told me this story about a parable of a king who asked for a game to be built, and uh, a wise person built chess. And they brought this to the, the king, and the king said, oh, that's, that's really cool. Um, how can I pay you? And they said, well, I guess back then rice was sort of the going currency. And they said, well, why don't you pay me one grain of rice on the first square, double it on the second square, and continue doubling it just across this, this chessboard? And the king said, yeah, no problem, easy. Well, it turns out when you get to the second half of the board, you end up with more grains of rice than there are atoms in our solar system. So it becomes quite problematic to fulfill your, your payment obligations. This is actually what's happening with AI right now. We're getting to the second half of the chessboard. We're still just doubling, but it's feeling more and more momentous because the doublings are getting huge in, in volume. And so let me introduce you to Martin. He's our board chair. He's also on the board of Alphabet, which is, is Google, um, the Broad, Stanford, et cetera. And he was the CFO of Goldman Sachs. But before that, he 
actually was a PhD in computational biology all the way back in the 80s, before that was even, I think, really like a formal thing. So he's a really interesting guy, and he's got a lot of perspective to share here. It is very clear to me that we've entered a new, a new regime in AI. The life sciences and the information sciences are converging. And I learned some things that might be relevant for what's going on in recursion and in drug discovery. The only way that you get to study problems in software simulation is by having gathered a lot of data first. You're never gonna crack the problem of drug discovery by just doing computation in a vacuum. Recursion is bringing together not only the computation, but a vast data set of perturbation biology. There's something of a crisis in science of being able to reproduce experimental results. And we all realized at about the same time that recursion really almost uniquely had addressed this problem in a comprehensive way. This is giving us a map of what's happening in those cells. What is that going to do? It's going to, it's going to change humanity um, and it is going to confer powers that seem like magic or science fiction or divine. And um, that's happening in our lifetimes. I do had a chance to meet Martin, um, and it's amazing to have him on our side. And so I'm going to end by just telling you a little bit about some of the things Recursion is doing now and over the next couple of years that I think will illuminate where the field is going for many of the companies in the space, and then we'll, we'll end with some questions. And in drug discovery, there are these different steps. You've got to figure out what disease to go after, then you've got to figure out what target you want to go after, and how you're going to optimize a molecule to go after that disease, et cetera, et cetera. And when recursion was founded, we were using these images of human cells to really do this second step, step two, target and hit ID. That's really what recursion was founded off of. And we'll talk about that in a minute, but we've started using technology across all of these steps. And so I'm gonna share a little bit about what we're doing at each one. And we're gonna start here with step one. What disease, what do we go after? Well, here comes ChatGPT. Literally, we are using ChatGPT and other GPT tools to actually take all of the world's literature, to scrape it, and to ask, are there places where our maps of biology, which I'll talk about in just a minute, tell us something that you cannot find in the literature anywhere? Because what recursion is not interested in doing is going after the 17th statin or the 17th uh, inhibitor of X, Y, or Z. There's other companies much better suited to do that. What we're interested in going after is completely novel hypotheses, completely novel ideas that you can only get to through this broad exploration of biology. And so we use these LLMs at Recursion to explore all known biology, to compare it with our maps of biology, and to ask where are their differences in a completely automated way across trillions of relationships. And then we leverage the LLMs again and we say, are any of these in disease areas where there are not effective treatments? Because to go through every disease manually would take forever. And so we use the LLMs to give us just an 80-20 scrape. And we've built these benchmarking systems, which in the bottom right, you'll see if we use the GPT-3.5 GPT Microsoft API, we can actually get it to correctly identify about 80% of the time whether an idea is novel, whether or not uh, a patient population is underserved. And that's great. The first thing Dean taught me was the 80-20 rule in his lab. If you get to 80% confident, move forward. Don't worry about the last 20% because it's gonna take you years. Get to 80%, take the next step. Get to 80%, take the next step. And this is allowing us to take trillions of relationships across biology and boil them down into just dozens of ideas that our team can start 
every few weeks to try and bring new medicines to patients. And many of those fail. Over half of those ideas fail, and that's totally okay. Because instead of taking years and building a team and building new experiments to try and go after a new disease, it literally takes us cents worth of computational power and then a few thousand dollars worth of laboratory work to actually get just a quick sense of whether one of these hypotheses could be interesting and worth exploring more deeply. So we want to move failure earlier in the process. And then, as I shared before, this imaging work that we started with CCM has now gone really, really broad. We now run one of the biggest, the biggest laboratory in the world uh, that makes images of human cells. And we do it at massive scale across lots of different cell types. In fact, in the last 12 months, we've made, I think, over 15 human brains worth of neural iPSC cells for our Roche Genentech collaboration. Like, you have to take cells from people's skin and other places and turn them into neurons, because those neurons don't divide, and it's hard to get people to donate brain tissue while they're alive, as one wouldn't be surprised to hear. And so we have to turn skin cells into neurons, and we do this at a scale of literally human brains worth of neurons. And we take all these different cells, and we put them through our laboratory. You saw that laboratory in the videos, where we can do up to 2.2 million experiments a week. That's generating this 23 petabytes of data I talked about before. And to explore all of that data, we actually run one of the fastest supercomputers in the world. I think it's currently like 130th. It goes down every week because that space is moving so fast. And, and as we get interesting insights from this, we can start to use ML and AI to identify relationships, to map biology. And these maps turn out to be really useful, and we've done them at huge scale. So this is the entire genome in one human cell type. These are endothelial cells where we got our start. And what you're seeing is every gene across the rows and every gene across the columns, and you see this dark red line across the diagonal. That dark red line is every gene compared to itself. And in this case, red means similar. So technical replicates of knocking out with CRISPR, each human gene look similar. That's great, that's good news, because that would be bad if that wasn't there. But do you see these clusters, these little squares? If you zoom in on these, zooming in on one little tiny cluster there, this is the JAK-STAT pathway. And if we had five extra hours, Connie, I don't know if you want to do five extra hours, I could go through the entire <laughs> diagonal and we could explore all of known biology. It'd be super fun. Um, there's all the proteasome pathway. It's all there. But what gets really exciting for us is when we find new stuff. That's what gets exciting. And this is an example from some work we published with Genentech right after we signed the partnership they were interested in this complex, this protein complex called the integrator complex. And it turns out it's in our map. You can see the cluster of genes that show up in our map here. And each of the genes here is a well-known component of the integrator complex, but there was this one gene, chromosome seven open reading frame 26, that was popping up right smack in the middle of this cluster. And so we said to Genentech, like, I mean, maybe this is part of the integrator complex. And they said, well, that would be really cool. Um, but can we really find stuff that easily? And we're like, yeah, we've got thousands of examples of novel biology like this. Let's go replicate it and or, or validate it. And as soon as we started to do that, somebody published a paper, I think just a few weeks later, that said C7 ORF26 is actually part of the integrator complex. And it was a reasonably good paper. And so Genentech was like, this is awesome. And so now we're going through these maps looking for, and building maps and neurons looking for thousands of examples of novel relationships like this, some of which might be druggable. And it turns out that this, when you go uh, exploring at the whole genome scale, you find other interesting things. For the scientists in the room, here's a nice little preprint we put out a few weeks ago where we used CRISPR-Cas9 to knock out every gene in the genome. And here I'm showing you every gene down the diagonal, but here we're arranging them from chromosome one all the way through the chromosomes. And it turns out there's something really worrisome here. Do you see these squares uh, that are showing up on the diagonal? These are telling us, let's see, these squares here, here. So this is chromosome one. You see one big square here and another big square here on each side of the chromosome. Turns out when you knock out genes with CRISPR-Cas9, you cause chromosome arm scale truncations. And we were able to see that because we had knocked out every gene in the genome, and we were able to actually publish this preprint, which has got a lot of interesting 
a, a lot of interest from folks because we're exploring biology at this huge scale. And it turns out this is relatively infrequent. It's about one to 3% of cells, depending on which cell type you're in, at least based on the data we've, we've looked at so far. And it's not just us. We were able to use public data sets from multiple different labs uh, to validate that CRISPR-Cas9 actually causes these uh, chromosome arm scale truncations, which is super interesting stuff. And this is the power of using these broad approaches to exploring biology. And we're not just using technology to find hits and targets, we're also using it to optimize our molecules. And so we're using really advanced ML and AI, things like multi-objective G-flow nets to build an AI that can actually design molecules to hit certain parameters. So if we want a molecule that will hit a specific protein and will have low toxicity in a variety of different ways, we're building AI systems that can do that in collaboration with Yoshua Bengio, who's one of the, the kind of pioneers of, of AI. We're building other tools like Mole, which is a foundation model for drug discovery, all of these to help bring new medicines to patients faster and at scale. And as Martin said in the video, you have to build huge data sets to fuel this. And so this is an example of a new work cell we've built, more robots that are generating huge data sets in um, DMPK. Uh, and, and add me tox profiling. These are later stages of drug discovery that can slow down almost every single program. And so we're building huge data sets here to try and train machine learning algorithms to get faster at optimizing molecules as we take them to the clinic. We're even doing this at the translation stage. So a couple years ago, we bought a company called Viam who had a similar philosophy to bringing industrialization to animal models. And what you see on the left this is a traditional uh, animal study called the rotorod assay, where they put mice or rats on this rod. This has been the way we study a lot of brain disease for the past, I don't know, 100 years or so. You put a, mice, a mouse or a rat on, and you start spinning this rod, and you slowly speed it up, and then you time how long it takes for the mouse or the rat to fall off. And it turns out if mice have something wrong in their brains, they actually fall off earlier. But this is super noisy, super arch archaic in many ways. And instead, at recursion, almost all of our animal studies that we run in-house are run in cages where there's no one interacting with the animal, it's just at home in its cage, and we use a, a, a camera in the top of the cage to actually detect movement and behavior and use ML and AI to turn that into mathematical representations of animal physiology and animal behavior so that we can use fewer animals, we hope, we can get better signal with less noise and actually um, interact with the animals less because it's very stressful for them. These are the tools of technology that we and many other companies are applying across every step of drug discovery, and I think it's what the future looks like. And we're starting to demonstrate early leading indicators of success that using these tools at a very early stage can already help us drive programs to the clinic for less and go faster. And I think we're just at the very beginning of this. And so as companies like Recursion and many others start to deploy these tools, inevitably there will be lots of failure. But over the coming five to 10 years, I think we're going to see incredible uh, movement in this space. And I'm going to skip through this. This was our unpublished data, Connie, but I think we're, we're down to the last 10 minutes. So if anyone's interested in foundation models for drug discovery, um, I'm happy to talk about this point of emergence, which is super cool after the talk. But let's go back to Archimedes. What is coming from recursion? Well, we're gonna build these things called foundation models. A foundation model is like ChatGPT, except for drug discovery. And we're building ones for biology, for chemistry, and we're gonna build models that overarch those two. And we're not only gonna use them at recursion, but we're actually gonna start sharing them with our biotech and pharma partners so that they can use them to advance their programs, hopefully more quickly as well. And at the intersection of technology and biotechnology today, what's obvious to me is that we have come so far, and yet, just like those mid-journey images I showed you earlier, as impressive as they are, there's still so far to go. But what I'm certain of is that the pace of change going forward will be unprecedented, and if we work together, we can go further faster. And I think the best way to end is by remembering the patients that we aim to serve, and because we're here today, I just want to show this very quick video 
uh, of one of the groups we've worked the most closely with over the last couple of years. This won't be surprising to any of you, but Connie A rare disease is defined as a disease that affects fewer than 200,000 people. This is a disease where one never knows each morning whether this is gonna be the day. The anxiety that comes with CCM is almost as difficult to live with as the disease itself because of the unpredictability of it. For our patients, we provide information, support, community. We also help develop centers of excellence for care. On the research side, we are the hub for the entire international research community. We have been working as partners with Recursion every step of the way, watching as the ideas for REC 994 developed, the clinical endpoints were thought of. This partnership of Recursion and the Alliance to develop a tool that can measure these other things, these other changes, is critical for respecting the patient experience. The partnerships that evolve between biotech companies, drug companies, and patient advocacy organizations are long-term endeavors. I believe that there's continuing work that the organization and the company can do together. Part of that is making sure that everyone has access to that medicine. And I think that's where the patient advocacy organization can help in finding the patients who need the treatment. And then the biotech company can work their magic to make sure that those patients are actually being provided with, with the treatment that may help them with their disease process. I started this work for my daughter. And 20 plus years later, I continue to do this work for my daughter, no matter what happens there is still quality of life, there's still value. For more information about cavernous malformations or for the work of the Alliance to Cure Cavernous Malformations, you can find us online at alliancetocure.org. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Connie. Thanks to the Alliance for all of your incredible work. I will end there. I appreciate all of your attention. We do have time for questions. Um, if you want to stay at your seat, Linda's coming around with a microphone and you can ask from there. Hello. Hi. Um, let me first start out by saying you gave a wonderful presentation. Oh, thank you. This is actually the, the audience that makes me the most nervous to talk to. <laughs> And um, I have three questions. One of which is, when did the scientists start recursion? We started recursion in 2013, so it's been almost 10 years. Wow. Oh. Um, and when did it get FDA approved? It hasn't yet, but fingers crossed. I mean, phase one. Ah, phase one we started in 2019. Um, and is a petabyte um, more than a terabyte? It is. I think it's a thousand terabytes. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you. Good questions. Um, so in the last year, um, I was diagnosed with CCM2, um, hypermobility, Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and epilepsy. Um, I was just curious if there are other conditions that have been linked to CCM, because my family doctor was saying, well, in the, throughout my life, I've had between 10 and 15, 15 surgeries, which all seemed just by coincidence. Um, 
And she said, you know, I think all of these are linked, all of these are related. Are there other conditions um, that have been linked possibly to CCM? Yeah, thanks for, thanks for sharing. I think that there's probably some physicians in the room who'd be best equipped to, to answer that question um, with all the latest research. Uh, but certainly a lot of biology is deeply interconnected. And when something goes wrong, I think it's not uncommon for, for many, you know, I think of it as like a tree. And if you make an injury to the trunk of a tree, then you get all these different branches that can be affected. So it's entirely possible. But unfortunately, because biology is so complex, I'm not aware of specific diseases that you mentioned being directly linked. But I don't know if other physicians want to give We're, a more accurate answer. I, I can say that in the patient conference today, you will have access to Dr. Fleming, Dr. Steinberg, Dr. Smith, and um, Ask again. Perfect. I'm the med school dropout, so I can't, <laughs> I can't help there. <laughs> there was, Allison had a question. Hello, thank you for your presentation. I'm a lawyer, so that's one of the reasons you have the slides, but <laughs> How are you protecting your intellectual property with AI, with the laws changing and everything so often, and the chat GPT, how are you protecting your intellectual property with everything you guys are doing? Yeah, the software side of intellectual property is fascinating and very different from the biotech side. Most of what we do is protected by trade secret and by going fast. So we just try to keep ahead. Um, the other thing I'd say is that that 23 petabytes of data we've generated, it's the largest data set like that in the world, and you can't train these neural nets the way we can without that kind of data. And so for us, in a way, that data is kind of what protects us. Um, but I should say Recursion is very committed to open science. So if you go to rxrx.ai, we've released some of the largest public data sets in the world. A good example is during the pandemic, um, we had a team that volunteered. We were one of the first groups in the world to infect human cells with live SARS-CoV-2 virus in a BSL-3 facility in late March of 2020. Primary human cells, lung cells, endothelial cells, et cetera. We ran a small screen, actually with the same roughly 2,000 drugs that we first looked at with, with CCM back in 20, the early 2010s. And we published all of the images from that screen in the second week of April, 300,000 images. And those have been uh, images that lots of people have used. So we publish a lot of that data to help other researchers advance their work. But for the business interests, just go fast. That's the answer in the tech side of things. Thank you again for the presentation. Um, this is a quick one. What is the expected outcome of the drug once it's uh, it's crossed uh, the next step? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is just see what the data tells us. It's the first drug that's ever going to go through a phase two trial that's sponsored by industry. And as you may have seen, there's a whole bunch of different endpoints. And because nobody's ever run a trial looking at most of these endpoints, we just don't know what we're going to find. And so the first thing we'll have to do is sit down with the agencies, sit down with the advisors uh, to, the, to the company, and try and make sense of what the data is telling us. And hopefully, there's some signal there that gives us hope that this drug could be helpful to patients. But that may not be the case. Um, if it is the case, then recursion certainly would find every way that we could to advance that medicine into later stages. And we would talk with the FDA, the EMA, and these other agencies about steps that we can take to try and get those medicines to patients fastest. But I'll use this opportunity, because I probably won't be able to talk like this next year, um, uh, given, given the timing of the trial readout, just to say that, on average, these trials fail. Almost all phase two trials fail. And so we're all very hopeful that our trial is successful. But I hope that everybody knows that even if we don't find the next treatment for CCM, we've made a lot of progress together because we've set a path by which other companies, some of which are here, uh, they can use to go faster to bring the next set of medicines across the line. And so we're all in this together. And we all hope this one is positive. But if not, we all hope the next one is positive after that. It just it, we have time zero. for just okay. one more question. Gary, 
Sorry, gotcha. Uh, really quick. I don't know whether it'd be better to ask you or physicians later on, but with the nitric oxide component, would it be more nitric oxide beneficial or negative? And obviously the inverse would be true. Yeah, the nitric oxide pathway is a very uh, complex one. Um, and nitric oxide does a whole bunch of stuff to the endothelium. And so I'm not really sure which way we'd, we'd, was good and which way is bad. Um, but the oxidative stress certainly interacts with nitric oxide. And uh, so at recursion, we want to reduce the amount of oxidative stress. And that may end up having an important effect on nitric oxide. Um, there should be more of it available. Um, but we don't know if that's good or bad. That's why we're doing the, the trial. Thank you. And, and that's a question you could ask Miguel Lopez Ramirez later. Perfect. Because he'll be talking to the patients. I should have just deferred. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Connie. You're welcome. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait. Yeah. Ron, how, is there a big question? It, it's real quick, I hope. I, there was something in your slide that went when you were showing all the pictures in the genomes, and I just wondered. So we've got a daughter that, hearing her thing about multiple symptoms of different things that has the CCM but has other things. So she's going through a full genome mapping now. And I wondered how that relates to some of the slides you showed. It didn't click that. I was just thinking this pharmaceutical before, but it seemed like that's yeah. a piece you were Yeah, touching. so there's a lot of great groups who are working to bring together um, genome sequences from patients all around the world who have some, you know, some disease or no disease, and to annotate those things. Those kinds of data, if you overlaid them with the kind of data we've developed, which is all from human cells in a laboratory, could actually be really complementary. So if you found like an interesting relationship from patients, you could ask whether that relationship holds in human cells. And of course, since we don't want to do any experiments in people until we have a lot of evidence behind something, we can do a lot of experiments in human cells to try and chase down some of those avenues. So I think they're very complementary, and we work with a number of partners who give us access to those data, and I should say there's huge data sets that are publicly available. The National Health System and others um, from the UK have put huge data sets out that can be really helpful for the rare disease community. Thank you Thank so much. You. Appreciate it, everybody. Thank you, Chris. <laughs>